Okay. Um, hi, everybody. I am Stacey Matrazo. I'm the executive director of the Florida Wildflower Foundation. Um, thank you for joining us for today's webinar, um, Propagation of Florida Native Wildflowers. For those of you not familiar with our uh, organization, our mission is to protect, connect, and expand native wildflower habitats through education, research, planting, and conservation programs. Our work is made possible primarily through the sale and renewal of the state wildflower license plate. Um, this is our old look. We now have, why can't I find my screen? We now have a, our new look here. Um, whether you have the old or the new, you are supporting our programs and we thank you. If you have the old or new tag, you are entitled to a free membership with the organization. You just need to let us know that you um, have the plate and we'll get you set up in our database. But those sales and renewals along with donations, um, memberships and other funding allow us to do programs like what you're seeing today, as well as um, re educational resources, um, field trips, all the different things that we are involved in are made possible by your support. Um, we'd like to encourage those of you who are um, interested in our work and find our programs valuable to consider becoming a member making a donation or purchasing the state wildflower license plate. You can do all of that at uh, our website, flawildflowers.org slash support. Um, be sure to check out um, our website for other resources on planting and growing wildflowers, as well as to find out what we've got coming up um, on our calendar. Uh, next month, we've got Lily Anderson Messick of the Florida Native Plant Society to tell us all about Florida's native milkweeds. Um, we have not finalized our July program, but we uh, hope to have that up on our calendar soon. We also have some great field trips coming up um, on Saturday, June 10th. Our own Emily Bell and Betsy Harris of the Florida Native Plant Society ICSIA chapter will um, take us on a visit to Julington, Durban. Creek Preserve, um, where we will have a chance to see rare, the rare and endemic Bartram's Ixia, whose flowers uh, only open for the first few hours of daylight. We also hope to see some native milkweed and a lot more. Um, be sure to follow us on social media or subscribe to our newsletter or take a look at our calendar on our website to stay abreast of all of our um, upcoming opportunities. I just have a couple of housekeeping um, items to go over before we get started. All attendees are muted with cameras off. If you have questions, please use the Q&A feature to submit them. Yes, the chat is active, but we are not monitoring that for questions. So please use the Q&A. We will address questions um, at the end of the talk as time permits. If your question is not answered, you can email it to us. Um, we are also including in the resources that we send out our presenter, Claudia Larson's email address, and she is also happy to answer any questions that we don't get to today. Um, the webinar is being recorded. It will be available on our website and our YouTube channels in about 24 to 48 hours. When it is available, we will send an email to everyone who's registered with a link to the recording, as well as resources from today's talk, and again, uh, Claudia's contact info as well. So now I'd just like to introduce our speaker. Um, after retiring from the environmental horticulture, I always mess that word up, environmental horticulture department as a biologist at the University of Florida in Gainesville, Claudia joined the Florida Wildflower Foundation as a consultant. She uh, worked with us to create educational materials. She administered our Seedlings for Schools grant program for many years. Um, and has just done a lot of work with our education and planting programs. In 2002, Claudia created a small wholesale nursery, Micanopy Wildflowers, to supply wildflowers for restoration projects, native plant landscapes, and butterfly gardens, and for retail sales at Central Florida nurseries. The wildflowers are grown from locally collected seed that Claudia propagates each fall and then sells the following year. She has grown native wildflowers for 30 years and cannot imagine gardening without them. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, let Claudia take over. I don't know what's happening. My mouse is not working. Sorry about that.
There we go. Claudia, uh, it's all you. Okay. Um, so, uh, shall I cross this off? Um, no, go ahead and share. Better your not screen. leave the webinar. <laughs> no, please don't leave the webinar. Okay, well, welcome everyone who's here this afternoon, and thank you for inviting me, Stacy. And um, I'm just grateful for all the foundation does to promote wildflowers. Y'all are absolutely wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. So, as Stacy mentioned, I am the owner of Micanopy Wildflowers. I'm a one-woman nursery. I do it all. <laughs> Uh, and I collect seed from mostly the North Central area. Um, and the nursery is in Micanopy, just on a little patch of my land. And I grow under kind of tall oaks and pines with shifting shade. Anyway, I do start every year from seed. Uh, my plants are in small pots. So um, generally they can't live in a pot for more than six or eight months. So I'm continually gathering seed and saving it and starting over every year, which is a great joy. If anybody is interested in growing wildflowers commercially, um, you can email me directly. I'll be glad to share any information. We sure need a lot more wildflower growers. There's so much um, call for wildflowers in, in all types of gardens and restorations. Okay, so propagation can actually be a semester long course for many months, uh, a one or two year master degree or long profession in horticulture. So as a biologist over 30 years, I learned a lot, but my real wildflower experience was gained, honed by trial and error on my own, and also by talking with others that grow native plants. So this is really a talk, not for, for professionals, but for just beginners who want to start growing wildflowers from seed. And I just would like to encourage you to explore wild propagation on your own. The following methods are just my methods that have served me well and a lot of some cues that I got from Mother Nature. So I just wanted to give a little historical background on wildflower growing. The New England Wildflower Society created an appreciation for introducing wildflowers into our landscapes and cataloging and protecting wildflowers and their ecosystems. The Garden in the Woods was created in 1931 by two horticulturists who were interested in the art of growing native plants. So in 1965, the garden was donated to the um, New England Wildflower Society, and that continues uh, to educate people and have conservation in their areas. So in the 1980s, Harry Phillips of the University of North Carolina, he saw the pressure being placed on wildflower populations for those that were collecting them for pharmaceutical, homeopathic, and commercial reasons. They were going in the woods and just scraping up all the Venus fly traps and the ginseng. He worked for wildflower conservation by advocating that people grow wildflowers commercially to take that pressure off wild populations. The North Carolina Botanical Garden has showcased wildflower gardening and education also for 30 years. Closer to home, Jan Midgley published this valuable book, Southeastern Wildflowers. And it's evident that she observed and recorded her propagation methods with great care. And this book uh, is the most useful one that I've really found, you know, in my journey of wildflower growing. And um, you can use her plant, plant family information just to generalize Florida plant families as well. And I'm also looking forward to the new propagation book by Dr. Sandy Wilson of the University of Florida Environmental Horticulture Department. I'm not sure if that's out yet, but uh, keep that on your radar. And gosh, I really appreciate everybody in FAN, all the nurserymen that have just experimented, gathered seeds and cuttings and worked with native plants throughout the years. They're a huge, huge source of information. So there are different techniques used to propagate plants, as you all know. And I do want to focus on seed production, but the other 
uh, methods are cuttings and division. So with cuttings, plant stems are trimmed and placed in media to form roots at the nodes. And I take my cuttings when the plants are actively growing and the weather is humid, which is mostly in the summertime. That really helps them root quickly. Um, just a few tips. You, I pack my media very firmly so it'll support the cuttings. You can use various media, soil, perlite, vermiculite, sand. And I use pretty small cuttings, two or three inches. Make sure the stems are rigid, not floppy, and not too woody. There's kind of that in between there where they're still flexible, but not too far on either side. Now you can use rooting hormones like IBA and Dip and Grow for woodier species or for ones that are difficult to grow. I generally don't use uh, root hormones at all. Wildflowers are pretty darn easy to root. I have to be sure to keep them in a shaded location with intermittent mist. And the recommendations for mist are usually to have the mist on for five seconds every 45 to 60 minutes. Not everybody has a mist system though. You can make a small mist system though. You can just use a single sprinkler head or there's micro irrigation parts available at the big box stores. And all you need is that, a hose, and a timer that counts in minutes. And if you don't want to go to all that trouble, just use a hose, water your plants two or three times just to keep them real hydrated. So you can stop the mist a few days after the roots have formed. You can kind of tug on them and feel how they're doing. And don't pot. Don't put them in the pots though, till you do have roots that can support that top. Easy cuttings can be made from horse mint, twin flower, hibiscus, salt and pepper bush, tropical sage, blue sage, and various asters. Now root cuttings are a lot of fun to try as well. Usually I use just two or three inch sections. You can see right here and just place them on the soil vertically or horizontally. And then I cover the little rootlets with soil and just wait till they sprout. You can see here how the, the plant sprouts right out of the root. Um, some plants that this works with, this of course is passion flower, uh, which really works well from the roots, especially when these little guys, these fritillaries are eating all your leaves and stems. So the roots are always going to be available for you. Other plants, you could use purple coneflower, yuccas, lizard's tail, rattlesnake master, and again, some asters are really easy to do with fruits. Division is a separation of clumping plants that have well-formed -form foliage and roots. So sometimes I trim the roots if needed. If it's pot-bound or really you know, gnarled up roots, I just take a um, serrated knife and chop off that bottom so you just have fresh roots to start with. Helps to remove any flowers. And I think it's easier to divide when the soil's a little dry so you can shake that soil out. And you can see kind of where the natural divisions are. Hold the plant by the base so you're not going to rip the leaves off. And just kind of tug them till they go apart in a natural way. And then plant, repot for a couple days, and you can acclimate them uh, gradually to the sun. So what are you going to divide? Plants that are easy are grasses, ferns, and wildflowers that spread by aerial roots like sunshine mimosa, partridge berry, fog fruit. Also plants that form foliage around a central stem are easy to divide like black-eyed season, mist flower, and a lot of asters. So this is a patch of wildflowers at the end of the summer. If you look hard, if you see that, <laughs> some people are inclined to cut back plants after flowering, but remember seeds are a huge storage facility for a beautiful future garden. 
Although the stems turn brown and wither away, seed heads contain germplasm that is alive or gently sleeping and dreaming of that perfect environmental condition to begin their new life. Seed propagation is the preferred method for producing a healthy population of plants. Seeds provide the most genetic diversity and they result in strong plants. <clears throat> so everybody wants to know, where do I get wildflower seed? Well, you can just get it from your own garden or from private property with permission from the owners but I wanna remind you not to collect from city, county, state, or federal parks without permission. You can also just buy native plants from uh, reliable nurseries and then just use those plants to start kind of your own little stock, stock plant area. So again, remember local seed provides the best adaptation to your soil and climate and try, you don't have to harvest every seed in a little patch, 10%. If you just have a little teaspoon or tablespoon of seeds uh, from a patch, I swear that is the most you will ever need to fill up a whole tray and have dozens and dozens of plants. It helps if you correctly identify the plant that you're collecting and record the name of the seed get all the seeds together, you're gonna forget what's what. Uh, also want to just tell you that permits are for collecting endangered or threatened plants can be obtained from the Division of Plant Industry in Gainesville. And they have lists of those plants on their website. But they generally just give permission to those people doing research. But, uh, the DPI is also a good source for wildflower identification. You may not know, but you can send samples of plants that are in flower and they'll do the correct identification for you. So there's many complications to pollination, but wildflowers have adapted for their best survival by forming different seed structures. I think this is the most fun for me for plant propagation is checking out all the different seed structures that plants have. It's just amazing. The seed must grow and become mature before it can be dispersed to a hopeful site. It must then wait till the environmental conditions are right. And water is usually the trigger for the emergence of shoots and roots from the seed. Here you see tropical sage salvia growing. And, you know, this is the plant and which, you know, matures into the seed capsule. And you can see as the seed capsule kind of opens, the tiny little seed is actually inside that capsule. And as it opens and matures, the seed can pop out. You can see all the seeds that have just kind of dropped out of all the capsules. The seeds mature at different times, so you should check each species over a period of days to get best results. You may have, like this slide before, you may have the flowers and the seed capsules going on at the same time. So, you know, just check them out over time so you can get the best results from what you capture. I just wanted to show you a few examples of uh, the seed structures. So capsules, are here, like we see the beer tongue, which forms these kind of hardish capsules, brown capsules. Meadow Beauty, really interesting little urn shaped capsule with all the seeds located in the bottom there. And this is our false petunia, which has elongated seed capsules that form along the tops of the leaves. Pods form in plants like wild indigo. You can see the flower. This is the mature pod. The pod will turn green first and then darken. And when you open that up, there's all the seeds lined up right along the suture. Very convenient. Just blip, 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 pop them off into your bag. 
Most people are pretty familiar with milkweeds, which have these elongated pods, which gradually darken and will open again by the suture. And the seeds will fly out on their little parachutes. You have scarlet hibiscus, opens up into its own perfect little form of flower to disperse the seeds. And here's typical pea plant, partridge pea. Opens up the dark seeds. When it's mature, the seeds will be dark brown and hard and shiny. There are plants with berries, including passion flower. There's the seed, the, well, the berries are inside this. Um, and there's, it's filled with gelatinous material, really gooey, but the seeds are all in there and it's protecting the seeds from desiccation. It's this rouge plant forming red seeds. You can see they're just still farming on some and mature on the others. And here's our little bird pepper or capsicum example of the flowers and the seed and the berries. Some seed will just have one seed. I mean, some berries will have one seed in it and others will have multiple seeds. And a keen or sometimes called a nutlet or indehiscent fruits with a seed coat free from its wall. Examples, cone flowers, goldenrod, purple cone flower, Again, the flower forms into the dark cone. And if you take a slice out of that, the seeds are actually tucked in very conveniently um, inside the cone. So one of the most important things I can tell you in this webinar is it's very important to collect the seed when it's ripe. So after flowering, most seeds ripen in maybe three weeks for many months. Really, it's all different. After flowering, uh, generally they're ready though when they're brown and shiny and when they fall out of their flower head or their capsule. Here's just an example. Looking closer at that what I just explained, the false petunia. The seeds are forming after the flowers. Here's an example of an immature capsule, the green one. And here's the capsule when it's brown and mature. But here's the one that has already opened and expelled its seeds. So there's no use in um, collecting that. The seeds are probably gone. This helps you um, really spend time with your plants and, and uh, get to know them. Uh, more interesting seed structures, the flower black-eyed Susan and its cone. Uh, we already saw partridge pea, scorpion tail. The seeds form along the flower stem and you can just zip them right off very easily. There's the seeds, rattlesnake master. Uh, these are a little prickly, but sometimes I just take a nail file or a pencil and you can just break this apart and you can see the types of seeds they have. So you're going to need to collect your, seed, your, collect your seeds and you don't need many tools, just maybe some scissors and some paper bags. You want to strip the seed heads into the paper bags or just snip off the stems. You can also use small bags or cheesecloth to tie over branches to collect the seeds before they naturally drop. And one little tip here for milkweed, it's really the best thing I've found is just putting a little rubber band around the seed as it matures. You can see it just gradually is starting to open here anyway. And um, it's sometimes very hard to collect the seed when it decides to pop on its own you'll never know so use that rubber band now commercial operations they actually use handheld vacuums or they collect off growing cloth 
And there are various tests for seed viability that they use before the seed is packaged and sown. At home, if you wanna check your seeds, you can put them in a moist paper towel and just observe germination at room temperature over about 10 days. If the seeds don't start to germinate in the paper towel, there's probably no sense in putting them into a tray and wasting your soil. After drying slightly in your bags, it's best to separate the seed heads from the dried debris and then store them in smaller bags. Cleaning outdoors or on a porch is good, but make sure it's a non-windy day because some of these seeds are so tiny, they'll blow right off your table. And there also may be some small bugs, ants, spiders that were in your bags when you collected the stems. So best to leave those outside. And if you have pests or insect larvae in some of your capsules, you can easily get rid of those by just popping them in a plastic bag and freezing them for uh, just 12 hours if needed. There's just certain methods that I use to clean the dry seeds after I have them in the big bag. One easy way is just by agitating. You can put your bouquet of seeds into that bag and shake it like a martini and just let seeds fall to your base of your bag and just throw away all what's left of your stems. Some seeds you're going to have to just hand pick. Um, at times you can turn these over and shake them fall out, but other times you'll really have to just use your fingers or some kind of tool to pick the seeds off the cones. One method I've found is this little kitty flea comb is really good for cleaning various grasses. You can just put your handful of uh, grass stems and run that comb over them and it'll dislodge the seeds. Very handy. This is just a little video showing hand picking some seeds. You can see they're mature, they're ready to come off that stem. You could probably shake them off, but also just hand stripping them with your hand is easy. The seed is actually the little tiny black dot at the end. This other is just the, the papyrus, I think it's called papus that um, nature uses to disperse the seed to other environments. All right, a quick example of hand cleaning some seeds. This is some goldenrod. And you can just see how easy it is. You know, you can just massage those little seeds right off the stem. And in no time, you'll just have a pile of seeds that are ready to store or to go ahead and uh, propagate in your media. Simple. You can see where you wouldn't want to do that on a windy day though. This is a Stokes Aster. Makes a beautiful little seed head there. And the seeds are actually in the interior. They're dried up inside there. And they just pop right out. Some seeds are gonna have really hard seed coats. It's like the penstemons. They're a little bit harder than you wanna just crush with your hands. So the best way I've found is just putting them in between two pieces of newspaper and just roll over them with the rolling pin. And you can use a mallet as well, but just a couple turns with the rolling pin uh, just smashes the hard capsule and releases all those little seeds inside. So after I've made a pile, uh, it's very convenient to sift the, the seeds. And I use this set of screens that I've just had forever, but I think you can buy soil, sieve, see, soil sieving screens online, different sizes. Um, 
even a plastic toy sandbox sieve. I've used that before, but you can just buy it at you know, the box store. Um, so you can see it's really going to be a good idea to do some sieving. So you have all your larger seed heads up here after sieving, have a nice clean set of, sieve, of seeds. Even though there may be some debris in there, some sticks, uh, I never worry about it because they'll just disintegrate. This is brown eyed season. So if you want to clean your berries, uh, it's a good idea to wear gloves. Sometimes that pulp has chemicals in it that inhibit germination that uh, may not be too good for sensitive skin. So you can soak your berries in water and then just lay them in a newspaper and crush. And then you put them back in the water and then the skins just float away and you're left with the seeds. This is the same seeds rouge plant, and you can also use air dry alternative, which is very handy. I can just leave these in a tup Tupperware on my potting bench, or sometimes I put them in the back of my car trunk, and in a few days, or maybe a week, they'll just dehydrate down to seeds that you can store easily. <clears throat> uh -oh. Let's see if I can go back one. There we go. So you have all these seeds and you might want to store them. You can sow, sow them as you're ready to, or you can just store them and then sow them all at once like I do. I use airtight bags or containers and I keep them in the refrigerator for, um, usually mine are in there for two or three months, depending on when I collected the seed. You just want to make sure it has constant temperature and reduced humidity. You can store wet seeds and berries um, in wet moss or sand in a baggie, usually one or two months before they just kind of rot out on you. Now, they say, how long can you keep seeds? But I really, you know, some people say like seven years, 10 years, but I wouldn't save them much longer than three years because that viability really goes down every year. Okay, so when are you going to sow the seeds? Think about when Mother Nature does it, when the seeds are naturally being planted, when they're falling out of their capsules and off their stems, that's probably a good time to sow your seeds as well. So I'll say you can sow them fresh any month. You have to think about if they have a light or dark requirements. And you have to think about breaking dormancy. I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about this because it's pretty important. Usually smaller seeds should not be covered at all. Tiny seeds really need light to germinate, and those include Coreopsis, Rudbeckias, Columbine, Rexia, Ageratum, Lobelia, Penstemon. I actually sow all my seeds actually on top of moist media. And sometimes I can lightly sprinkle with a little extra media on top, but basically it's on top of the media. For seed dormancy, well, dormancy prevents the seeds from germinating too early before the environmental conditions are right. Also, many plants require a period of cold and alternating temperatures to germinate. This is called stratification. And it usually occurs naturally in Florida between November and February. But that's what I do. I sow my seeds in November, and then I just leave them outside to naturally go through all the changes in weather. And it works very well for me. But you can also achieve this with time inside of the refrigerator. You can just leave them inside there for four to six weeks. And then sow all your seeds at once in February and March. This is kind of central Florida. Uh, you may have to adapt a little bit for north or south. So seeds with really hard seed coats, and I'm talking about coral bean, wild indigo, uh, gopher apple, 
Chrysopsis. Um, you need to scarify, which is going to scar or nick that hard seed coat to allow water to be delivered to the little plant embryo. And you can rub those seeds on top of sandpaper. You can nick them with the file. But the easiest way, just use that hot water soak. Boil your water. Let it sit for 20 to 30 minutes. Don't put your seeds in boiling water. Uh, let it sit and then let your seeds just sit for 12 to 24 hours to kind of soften that seed coat. So when your seedlings are come, uh, when you are ready to sow your seeds, you want to use a weed and pathogen free sterile soil, sand or vermiculite. And again, very important containers with good drainage. Uh, the way I do it is I go ahead and water the media in the tray so it's already wet, but it's drained. Then I broadcast the seed on top. You can broadcast your seed over the whole tray, or if you want to make nice, neat little rows, you can do that as well. And then I tamp mine just with my hand or with a plastic bag to make sure the seeds are in contact with the soil. Then I'll water those seeds gently in again, to kind of nestle them into the soil and then label and date them. I have trouble with uh, squirrels grabbing my labels. So I actually put my labels, I squish them way down on the sides of the trays. So I'll know what my seeds are when they're coming up. Uh, after I've sown the seeds, I just place them in the shade off the ground I water them every day or every other day, depending on their needs. Uh, the worst thing you can do is overwatering them. Uh, the other thing I found helpful is a micro mesh cloth, which you can find on the internet. It's very fine fabric with has like ninety percent um, sun. Sun can get through, and. It uh, will keep out the squirrels and armadillos, things like that. And I do cover my plants at night just to save them from that disruption. Very handy stuff, micro mesh netting. So here's what my seeds look like. You can see they're just laying on top. I do use some contain some uh, cell packs for things like grasses and uh, liatris. Uh, generally, they're all just kind of broadcast out there. Now, seeds will start emerging in 10 or 12 weeks, but if you do not see any plants coming up, don't blame yourself. Some seeds have erratic germination or very long germination and are difficult to propagate. Uh, some seeds require alternating temperatures like Rexia that's really hard to control. Orchid seeds require mycorrhizal fungi for germination. And I've read to start a trillium takes five to seven years. <laughs> Some species will root and grow in a tray, but not transplant easily into a larger pot or the garden. Those would be like pinewoods milkweed, the Asclepias humestrata, lupins, and Catesby lily. Those are things I've all tried unsuccessfully to grow. They grow, but they don't transplant for me. So other hazards to propagation that have happened to me I kept my trays too wet or too dry. There was a deluge of rain over a few weeks that rotted my, my seeds. Maybe my seeds were immature or infertile. There's damping off fungus that can rot emerging seedlings. Snails and slugs can attack at night. My worst are the squirrels and armadillos that dump out my seed trays. So after reading this, Discouraging list, I will say it's still very worthwhile to grow wildflowers from seed, and it's easy. You'll have success. Most seeds will germinate and reward you with dozens and dozens of new plants for your garden. 
So when your plants are coming up in your seed trays, usually um, I wait till they're two or three inches tall and they should have at least four leaves. But the most important thing is to make sure they have sufficient roots. Sometimes the leaves will come up, but the roots will be a little bit farther behind. Make sure they have good enough root to support that top. Uh, I acclimate the plants, I'll transplant them into pots, and I'll leave them in shade for, you know, a week or two before I move them out to the sun, just to give them a chance to get going. If you want, you can fertilize. I don't really fertilize plants unless I need to, but you can use fertilizer every couple of weeks. Um, you can use like a one-third or half-strength miracle Grow or fish emulsion. But again, if your plants are healthy, you know, why waste that time and, and money? So your plants are ready to go in the garden when the roots have reached the sides and the bottom of your pot. You want to mulch your plants very lightly, hopefully with pine straw or some light leaves, leaf mulch. And then just water until they're established. So I want to thank you for gardening with native plants and wildflowers and providing habitat for Florida insects, birds, animals, and helping connect natural areas in your community. Florida Wildflower Foundation has an amazing plan that's free for downloading. The seven steps to collecting and sowing wildflower seed has much of the information from this webinar all in one simple page, very candy. Also check out information from FAN Nurseries and the Florida Wildflower Seed Co-op. If you don't wanna to go to all the trouble to collect seeds and grow them on your own, you can just buy them from the co-op. They're all packaged up and ready to go. And they have instructions and videos on starting wildflower plantings from seed. So please check them out. So watching, collecting seeds and growing plants takes time, but you'll become more confident. You'll succeed if you pay attention to the critical stages and don't allow your plants to dry out or get overwatered. I hope you'll give it a try. More than anything, propagating wildflowers will give you great appreciation for mother nature and the realization and need for wildflower conservation in natural areas here in Florida. Thank you. Thanks, Claudia. It's a lot of information to take in. Um, we have quite a few questions as well. Um, our first question from Leslie is, do you have any advice on growing or propagating St. John's wort? John's wort is one that I uh, actually don't grow, and I haven't had that much um, luck with it. I've, I've done some just different hypericums, but um, I haven't been that successful. But I'm glad you said that, because um, if you are interested in growing some different or special seeds, uh, there's a lot of research that's going on, and you can go and Google and find papers done by graduate students and PhD students who spent their whole time trying to figure out the secrets of different plant propagation. So if you can just look up, you know, St. John's work propagation, uh, you should be able to find some different techniques that'll help you in case there's something about needing light or dark or, you know, again, alternating temperatures. So give that a try. Great. I have a couple questions on um, around, around seeds that need scarification. Um, if you're using the hot water soak method, do you need to remove the seed coat after you've soaked it, or do you just plant them right from the soak? Nope, I plant it right from the soak. I put it in uh, just my vegetable sieve and drain that water off, and then I'll just put it right on um, the media. And also those with the hot uh, are usually larger seeds. So for coral bean and baptisia and wild indigo, I do cover them with soil uh, about the same depth that, that, um, of the seed. So um, go ahead and cover those 
with soil and I've never had any trouble getting those to propagate. And if you don't scarify them and just put them out in the in the garden, will they mm -hmm. eventually germinate or is that they should they should not it won't be a hundred percent you should get a certain percentage though and again it may take months it could take a year you know just depending on on the water and how long it takes that seed coat to soften up but yeah because you know they work in nature so that's <laughs> definitely going to work for you too um Let's see. Henry is asking if uh, you would recommend putting in a flood tray to let water seep from below or just using a fine mist to water from above. Uh, I'm not sure what a flood tray is. I just make sure that my again, I don't put anything on the ground. I make sure that it's that it's perched either on bricks or wood. I just use, you know, pieces of wood and bricks for my little benches. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm afraid to use a flood tray. Well, yeah, you just want to make sure it can it can drain. What was the other part of the question? Um, just whether letting the water seep in from below or. Oh, um, yeah. No, I, I am not a fan of that. Um, yeah, your seeds are actually on top of the media and uh, you're just going to create uh, just a wet habitat or a wet mess of soil at the bottom, which is not going to be helpful for the seeds. Just go ahead, make sure you've watered them and it has drainage. You know they'll need water. I mean, if you see the soil or the seeds drying out at all on the top, go ahead and water them. And you don't need to water them, you know, drench them, but just make sure they stay moist. Yeah. How do you decide which species get that open, the whole tray or um, versus the smaller cells? What, what's your decision for which ones get which type of um, home? Just a large tray or the or like a cell pack, you mean? Or? Yeah, yeah. Um, I do just, mostly I just stick with the grasses, the things. Um, I've tried to do like Coreopsis and things and cell packs but then they're just too many plants and they're just crowded and it's uh, they don't grow into a nice plant. You know, they're just too crowded in there. So yeah, just everything else just goes in the tray and then I'll just divide them up as they, you know, when they're mature. Um, trying to think of anything else that would be good in cell packs, but um, yeah, you could do individual seeds. Cell packs just kind of are small though, and you're just kind of, I think you're asking for trouble sometimes because, you know, they're, they're easy to dry out and, uh, no, it, it just easier for um, just using a tray. Okay. Um, it's me, yeah. give it a try. <laughs> You'll never know till you try. CJ is asking um, what you think about growing sky blue lupin seeds in biodegradable pots. Um, that's a good, yeah, that's always good to try. Good to try that. Um, I've actually tried that with the Asclepius, uh, the uh, Humistrata. And uh, again, I've had, I just haven't had lupins that you know, they may last one year, but they just don't come back for me. So, uh, you know, I don't know the secret of that, but, uh, you know, surely the biodegradable, you know, biodegradable pot is a, a, a good option. Yeah, Maybe. probably for any pot, for anything, you know, if you just were even doing Coreopsis or something, if you wanted to do uh, like a program with school kids and give them biodegradable pot, they could just take home and plant. You know, things like that work great. Yeah, I would think for anything that might be more difficult to transplant, maybe that would be yeah. an option to try. Yeah, yeah, that could be. Um, it's just kind of uh, for somebody like me that grows wholesale, that's kind of a, a big expense. But um, yeah, for uh, just homeowners or like for, you know, small projects, school projects, definitely go for it. I have a couple of questions asking if you ever sow um, directly in the ground or propagate wildly, or if everything you do is in trays. 
No, I do sow in the ground. Um, I've got uh, quite a few acres here in Micanopy, and all my leftover seeds go right into the fields. Um, I have like sparse bahia grass with lots of sand in between. So I've been able to, you know, really enhance, you know, the areas around my home and the meadow and where all my gopher tortoises live um, mm -hmm. with just seeds. And again, I'll just put them on top of the soil and hopefully I'll just do it in the fall or the real early spring. Um, but yeah, definitely that's the easiest way to go for sure. But just make sure that, you know, you don't have a lot of competition from other weeds or grasses. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, there's so many questions here. <laughs> All right. Don't forget to email me. <laughs> We still have a few minutes before we hit three. So if you're okay, I'm going to keep going. Sure. With you. Um, do you have any tips on getting echinacea to germinate? Um, I never have trouble with that. Um, let's see. I don't know if there's any special. Just make sure that those seeds are mature, maybe, you know, when you're uh, collecting them out of the cone. And I also definitely give them some cold stratification. I put them in the refrigerator for at least three or four weeks and try that. Um, that that'd be my best bet there. And, and also their seed is a little bit big. So I might cover them with just a tad of soil and tamp them in um, just to make sure that they're gonna stay moist and, and uh, you know have good habitat to germinate. Um, what what mix do you use when you're um, when you're doing your trays or starting your wildflower seeds? Is it just uh, sterile soil, or what are you using other components? Yeah, it, it's just a it's just a peat. It's ground uh, peat, ground up pine bark, and vermiculite. And sometimes I'll have a mix with a little perlite in it. But it's a commercial mix that I get from BWI. Um, so I've used that for years and years. Um, it's probably pretty similar to what you might find in the bags of uh, Metro Mix or, or a miracle Grow Garden Mix. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's see. Do you have any tips um, specifically on propagating woody flowering shrubs like button sage lantana or gray leaf tea bush? And I think I would add to that, um, you know, how do you know, um, as far as cuttings, like how do all plants respond to cuttings, those woody species, or are only some going to be able to be propagated that way? No, I think just about all plants, um, you know, there's <clears throat> a lot of propagation books that deal with that, with uh, cuttings. I know there's uh, one, um, maybe Sandra Wilson's will, will go for that, <laughs> but um, mostly you want to make sure the plant is not uh, too young. You want it to be mature. Some things that I take cuttings of, I actually wait till after they flowered. And that way the stems had time to get a little bit more heft to it. And then just do my cuttings from that. Um, so, and again, mostly I do that in the, you know, early to late summer. Um, but you shouldn't have any trouble with the lantana, but it's just, you know, when you cut a long enough piece from that <clears throat> and you just have to kind of work your way down, take off anything that's too flexible and anything that's really stiff and woody with something that has no flexibility, you'll cut that off. Hopefully there's that part in the middle that's just right that has still two or three uh, leaves on it that you can stick. Uh, also, you want to make sure you have a good node. Roots are going to come out of the node. Uh, they don't really come out of the bottom of the stem very, very well. Some do, but not very well. So uh, make sure you have a node or two into the soil, if that makes sense. But um, yeah, just pay attention to the woodiness of that. Or, and try some um, some of that dip and grow. You know, they sell that at Lowe's. And um, that does uh, definitely does improve germination percentages. Great. Um, okay, let's see a couple more questions here. How do you know which seeds prefer the dark germination conditions? You know, I was going to do some extra reading on that because 
I'm not really sure. I've read certain things need that, like flocks, and um, if I can find it in my notes. Um, but I just haven't found that to be true, you know, to hold me up very much. So uh, I don't know what to say about that, except just do your own little search online about what needs dark or light. Uh, I pretty much just go with light for everything. Yeah. Um, and then I have a couple of questions about um, the wet paper towel method. Um, uh, Paula is asking specifically about using that for Asclepias tuberosa. Um, she said she's been told that they hate water. Um, and then Daphne's also asking if some seeds need to or would be better with the wet paper towel method. Um. I have never used that except to check my germination um, to see if the seeds are viable. But I've seen that on websites like, uh, you know, on uh, the federal, I don't know, several really big grower websites that do a lot of Asclepia propagation have, have talked about that. So uh, I don't know. I think Jeff Norsini uses that too, but I think you just use the have the paper towel and you make sure it's not soaking. You just want it to be damp. You place your seeds inside, and then you put them inside your plastic bag, and then you'll have to check them every three or four days. And then, as I understand, as soon as the seedling emerges or the root, sometime the root comes out first. As soon as you see that happening out of the seed, then you want to put it into soil to continue growing. So that just seems like a lot of trouble when <laughs> you can just put it in the soil. But uh, again, just do uh, some research on that. But I, I don't have any personal experience with that. I don't have trouble with uh, Asclepia seeds. I've done them with the cold method, having them in my refrigerator. And then I sow them in February. And then I've also just sown them right out of the pod. After I dry them a little bit, I always dry them in the paper bag for a few days. And uh, I've always had success both, both ways. We definitely need more milkweed out there. Ooh, need more all wildflowers. <laughs> That's true. Um, okay, last question. When you're using the trays, do you need to thin the seedlings uh, once they start coming out? Are they, is there an issue with them being too close together? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on what it is, um, as soon as plants are ready to um, transplant, I try to stay on top of my trays and start taking them out. Um, but also you can just wait if they do seem a little uh, tight in there, just pick up your clump and then you can thin that clump because you're going to have so many seedlings. You can thin your clump to two or three small seedlings and put those in the pot just so, you know, they have a little friend to grow with. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I'm, yeah, my seedlings are definitely some of them very crowded, but I just find a way to tease them apart and pick the ones that look like they're the strongest and use those for the pot. Yeah, but you could thin them out as well. I mean, there, there's there's be no problem in doing that, especially when you have a zillion coming up in a seed tray. You definitely, you know, just pop them out. That's probably a good idea. I might try that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Claudia. Um, for those of you whose questions were not answered, um, we will be sending Claudia's email address out in the resources. You'll get that email in the next day or two. Um, so feel free to um, email Claudia with any questions that you have um, regarding propagating native wildflowers. Um, thanks for being here with us today, Claudia. This is always um, was always our most popular workshop at the symposium when we had uh, our live education program. So I, I knew this would be. Um, a popular webinar and one that um, I'm excited about because we've been collecting seeds in our yard for a while. I know. We all need to grow more and have a diversity of wildflowers. So thank you so much. I've enjoyed it. Absolutely. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, please visit our website, flawildflowers.org to find out what uh, we're up to and subscribe to our newsletter and uh, support us with a donation membership or a license plate purchase. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.